Coming up next on All About Android, it's me, Jason Howell, joined by Ron Richards. Win is out, but we have Juan Bagnell, some gadget guy, joining us today. Why? Well, part of the reason why is because he, Juan, had a review of the OnePlus Pad, and today I give my review of the OnePlus Pad, so it's kind of like we get to both share our thoughts on what we thought about that. Also, Juan talks a little bit about his review of the Mavoid Tick Watch Pro 5. We've got news about the, the Pixel 8 Pro having a temporary temperature sensor, uh, a possible second foldable phone that Google gave up on maybe at the last minute. I don't know. We certainly didn't see it. And Ron's still angry about YouTube and its podcast strategy, plus your email and a whole lot more next on All About Android. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is All About Android, episode 632, recorded Tuesday, May 30th, 2023. OnePlus Pad Review. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by Decisions. Don't let complexity block your company's growth. Decisions rules-driven process automation software allows you to manage a complex digital landscape, build custom workflows, business rules software, modernize legacy systems, and improve customer experiences in Decisions' unified no-code platform. Visit decisions.com slash twit to learn how automating anything can change everything. Also, Thank you for listening to this podcast. As an ad-supported network, we're always looking for new partners with products and services that'll benefit our audience. With our tailored host red ads, you'll get an authentic and proper introduction to your brand with every ad read. You can visit twit.tv slash advertise and launch your campaign today. Hello and welcome to All About Android, your weekly source for the latest news, hardware, apps for the Android faithful. Sometimes it's just hardware and apps and feedback, as is the case tonight. I'm Jason Howell. And I'm Ron Richards, and I'm here for the hardware, Jason. Yeah, that's it. why we got two blocks of hardware coming at you tonight. <laughs> and of course, well, unfortunately, Wynn could not join us this evening. She has the night off, so yep. she'll be back next week. But we are fortunate to welcome back Juan Bagnell, somegadgetguy.com. So often, Juan, you're on, we, we joked about this on the show, I know many times, so often you're on when I'm out. So I love when yeah. we can both be on the show and prove we aren't the same this person. This is nice. <laughs> yeah, I missed your face. This is this is great. Thank you for having me on. And uh, yeah, I'm here for the hardware too. I, I know. You said it was going to be like a hardware and review heavy block and you're like, I'm here for it. I, Let's do that. You, you do a lot of that. With some gadget guy mm -hmm. com, it turns out <laughs> you keep yourself busy with the hardware. What are we looking at right now? What is yeah. this? Oh man. So it just breaking in like a lot more lifestyle tech these days, like batteries and solar panels. And I'm really big on e-bikes right now. We're kind of going nice. through an e-bike renaissance. So this is a bike that we got from my wife and, uh, just really changing up sort of our weekend rides and stuff. So some, some really, really fun things that we're getting to, uh, spend some time with and also just, uh, you know, some more ways that we can kind of tech, take tech out into other experiences and, and kind of augment those experiences. Yeah. So, okay. So that's your wife's e-bike. Do you have one yeah. also? Oh yeah. So oh, I'm, okay. I'm, I kind of went a little silly going with a big old, uh, fat tire. Um, it's a ridiculously powerful motor that I definitely don't need, <laughs> but, uh, some of the hiking and horse trails around our neighborhood are, so much fun when you really get that torque going. Yeah, no so, kidding. So, um, yeah, we, we've just been kind of building off of that. And uh, Lex is only seven, but she's already on a mountain bike too. So the family rides are getting pretty, uh, pretty technical. It's really cool. Nice. That looks like so much fun. Yeah. We have we've had a couple of e-bikes out of the front lobby here for a number of weeks, and so I know that there's uh, there's some reviews happening there as well. I have not ridden one actually yet, so I should probably plunk down on one of those out there and see what it's all about. See what it's like to get a little yeah. assist when you're riding a bike. Yeah, if, if you're into cycling, I mean, it, it is really cool. And the thing I like about my fat tire is if you're not using the motor at all, it's kind of a harder workout because it's so much heavier. Totally. You, you handle the bike totally differently. But when you want just that little bit of boost or you want to like, you know, just kind of ease up this hill or something, it's it's just enough to kind of push you along. Uh, it, it really has been uh, exciting to see how the entire segment has opened up. And now there are so many different varieties of experiences and like, 
uh, options that you can shop at price points that really aren't that expensive. So, I, I mean, again, if you're into cycling at all, I think now is a really good time just to get a lay of the market, just like see what what's going on in that. And uh, even just reducing your use of your car. I mean, all of our yeah. little neighborhood supermarkets, I've got bags on my bike and it's kind of nice not taking that silly half one and a half mile drive totally. to go pick up some groceries for the day. Not needed. Not necessary. When you say fat tire, I have seen bikes that have like the tire that is like that wide. It's like not oh, it's, quite a motorcycle it's, it's tire. It's a chunky but, boy. Yeah. Okay. So this is, that's what I've seen yeah. then. Okay. I've always wondered about yeah. those. They look very heavy. They're, they're, <laughs> well, they are, so so the combination of a fat tire frame because you need the extra mat. I, I'm I'm sorry. We're gonna it's I'm okay. gonna run over your we, entire podcast. We, talking we, about e-bikes. You're gonna run over it with the e bike. <laughs> Roll That's over. The thing. It. Roll over it. <laughs> but but what but what's cool about the the fat tires for the extra weight is it spreads out your road feel a little. So it's uh-huh. actually not a great road bike because you kind of want like. Um, you kind of want the lighter, the lighter frame and the better aerodynamics and, and like the better kind of road handling feel. Right. But I have really rough roads out in my neighborhood and you don't feel any of it. That's that big old right cushy tire is, for that for is sure. like, yeah, it's like riding a Barca lounger. You just kind of, there's a pothole. Okay. You don't feel it. You just kind of go uh, right over it. You go over so that pothole. You don't finding, apologize about it either. You just go. Uh, you just go. <laughs> and it's so nice. As nice. opposed to like a good road bike where it's like rattling the filling. Oh, yeah, totally. Skull, but you fly over the, the. It's all about the right tool for the right job. Yeah, the handlebars if you're not careful. Cool. <laughs> right, head over. Yeah, <laughs> Superman it. Well, it's great to get you on, Juan. Always a pleasure getting you on the show. And we've got a lot to talk about. Like we said earlier, we got some hardware to talk about. Hardware that uh, Juan has already reviewed. Uh, if you follow him, you will know uh, you, you'll know his his perspective on it. But uh, I've been playing around with the OnePlus Pad. So why don't we get to hardware and check it out? And if you want to say something, Victor, you can. I realize it's not the news bumper. Ah, Jesus missed the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> or if you want to sing something, see, we can just dub that and make an intro out of it. Sing for your hardware, sir. <laughs> sing for it. Uh, we need we need like a ta- we need a tablet theme song, Jason, because I feel like I, I'm oh, excited because I feel like this is the first of many discussions of tablets. It's a wave. So. We're at the beginning of the wave. Yep. Yeah. So the OnePlus Pad. I feel like the the NDA for the reviews lifted on this about a month ago, which is probably about when you did your review, right, Juan? Yeah, I was part of that early embargo and we had it for a little bit more than a week before they, they let us lift and, and talk about using the tablet. But I'm really anxious to hear your thoughts because even from when I had it to now, now I think we're getting a better sense of what this is going to look like in consumers hands. Because what I had was it was finished hardware, but it definitely needed that day one update. The software was really pre-release. It was really embargo early access. So I'm kind of curious to hear how your experiences have been, if if they kind of vibe with what I got to experience. Yeah. So, um, you know, I also have had the pad, uh, the OnePlus pad for, I'd say, probably about a week and a half of, of solid use. Um, and uh, you know, OnePlus sent this to me. I'm going to be shipping it back either tomorrow or the next day because uh, apparently they have a lot of demand on these devices. So as mm-hmm. you can see here, I have the OnePlus pad, which is the tablet itself. I've got their, what is it called? The stylo that uh, snaps to the top. I really like the snapping mechanism. It's a little magnetic snap and right away I get the little notification that tells me that it's connected. It charges wirelessly up here. So that's pretty sweet. You can remove the tips. I'm not sure why you want to remove the tips. Is just that like, do they provide different angles? I'm not really quite sure. It actually has a a different firmness. Different like you firmness. can you yeah, can how the firm. how the feel is against. And then also I, I think it's for if they start to wear out over time. Oh you can swap okay. that pen tip. Oh wow. People are rough on a their lot pens. Of work. Yeah, apparently. Uh, so you got yeah. the sty- well, I, Oh, sorry. What were you gonna say? I was gonna say with a lot of a lot of use, you're gonna run into that problem, right? Yeah, like, which which yeah. I mean, admittedly, 
I'm not going to be the, I'm not the user to give a lot of use on the stylus. I'm, uh, you know, time and time again, when a stylus is part of a, part of a package, I find myself like struggling to remember to use it or to find reasons to <laughs> use it. I'm not really an artist with my tablet, so I'm not, you know, pulling it out to, to draw pictures and, and, uh, do, you know, refinements like that. I'm also not using this, a, a stylus to do any navigation stuff. You know, you really use something like this for like note taking and, and creative stuff. And so, so I'm the wrong person on that, but I do think that, you know, for $99, we're still, we're really starting with the uh, things that are far below the fold here. Uh, but with the stylo, it's $99. <laughs> and, uh, I think if you want a stylus, I mean, it seems like the integration is pretty sweet and, uh, you know, having it, having it actually dock kind of, uh, magnetically to the top it has a place to go, I guess is my point. So that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty sweet. You can also see here, I've got the, the keyboard, um, the, what is it called? The one plus magnetic keyboard. This is a uh, shaded green because the tablet itself is actually green. If I pull all this stuff apart, you can kind of see uh, a little bit of fingerprinty on the back, but it's, it's kind of like a polished, um, polished green color on the back. And yeah, the tablet itself um, I love the color. I'm a big fan of the, the green color. I probably should have taken that sticker off. So I'll go ahead and cover it. Um, big fan of the color. I think the green color is just, it's really nice in person. I don't know how much it comes through, uh, on the, on the, uh, the camera and through the podcast, but, um, it's a really comfortable tablet too. Like it's got a really nice rounding the curvature. Uh, it feels thin and narrow enough. I don't know. It's a, it's just a comfortable tablet, like pulling it out, you know, you know what I have to compare it against are the Samsung tablets. Um, some of the premium Samsung tablets just have this like hard edge that looks nice. Like, you know, when you look at the tablet, it, it kind of has a kind of a fancy premium quality to it. But often when I be holding those tablets, you know, I kind of feel the edges into the palm of my hand. And with a device like this is big enough that when you're holding it, you want it to be comfortable because it's just a little bit larger than you might be used to using. And so at least get the comfort right. And I feel like the OnePlus yeah. pad gets the I, comfort right. I need, I need to jump in and ask because uh, there were two fairly high profile early reviews that listed the bezels as being cons. Oh boy, I Lexus do not pad. care at all. Uh, now, 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 Jason, this is very serious. If we're talking about the hand feel, are you able to hold and use the tablet with those smaller bezels than what might be on some of the competitors? Can, can we can we take a, can we take a moment and get a rating on the hand feel, Jason? <laughs> yes, this is four hands out of five. Okay, yeah. four, <laughs> four hands, uh, eight eight fingers out of ten. Is, is that so the rating? I, I'm bringing no, this I up haven't, I haven't had any issues. I mean, I feel my, like that my, bezel my is wide is, enough. No? So, so like the way you're holding it right there, the, the one issue that I ran into personally, and, and this is actually something that's impacting me on a Windows tablet too, is I'm interacting with the screen whenever I'm doing something like docking it with the keyboard. Mm -hmm. But when I'm just using the tablet, when I'm holding the tablet, you know, even when I'm sketching with the tablet, I felt like those bezels were functional. Like I didn't think that the narrower borders around the screen were preventing me from no. using the tablet well. No, I would absolutely agree. And I just took that sticker off. There we go. Um, yeah, I would, I would absolutely sticker. agree. I mean, there, sure. Are you going to get weird little phantom touches here and there? I, I suppose so. But um, I feel like that's an appropriate amount of bezel because I do understand I like was, if it was to yeah, the edge, really well balanced. if it was to the edge, yeah, that would totally get in the way with something that you're, you know, have in the palm of your hand and you'd get some of those, you know, those touches that you didn't mean for. So I don't mind having a little bit of a, a bezel, not to mention like the bezel itself is curved with the contours of the glass. So it looks mm -hmm. very refined. Like sometimes you see these and maybe it's nitpicking, but you see these round edges and then you see a square corner on the display. Display, oh, yeah, that, you know, my o it, it triggers my OCD. Totally, I don't, I don't like it when those <laughs> yeah. mismatch. Totally, yeah. this feels a lot more intentional from a design perspective to have that. It's just very pleasing to my eyes. Um, I don't mind the bezels at all, but I feel like I've really come around as far as my opinion on bezels in general. You know, it used to be that if there was any sight of any bezel whatsoever, I'd be like, oh, that's so <laughs> ugly. Oh. And then for the reasons that you're talking about. 
from a usability standpoint, it might look nicer, but then you start to use it and you realize, oh, well, actually yeah. those bezels serve a purpose. I was just surprised to see people criticizing that they were too small. I think that's the thing that kind of. I think that's legacy where, thinking where, of what I'm talking about right there. You know what I mean? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. yeah like w at what point did we decide that that was a, 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 a deal breaker. criticism? Totally. Yeah, I totally exactly. agree. Yeah. I, yeah, that's exactly where I'm at. Um, I was on the airplane and pulled out my headphones and then realized, oh, wait a minute, this doesn't have a headphone jack. So there is yeah. that. Uh, if you want to do, you know, headphones, you got to do wireless, which is not entirely surprising, I suppose. But I guess on tablets, sometimes I, I think I've, I'm have i still used to seeing on tablets. They they still include the headphone jack um, and uh, I expected to find it. But then I had uh, the Pixel Buds Pro with me, which are the noise canceling ones anyways. So I was like, oh, actually, this doesn't matter. I'll just connect via Bluetooth and you know, I'm on an airplane. I'm on a noisy airplane. I want to cancel the noise anyway, so it doesn't really matter that much. But um, but overall, I like the design. It's got the four um, four speakers on both uh, both sides. You've got kind of the quad speaker array. The speakers sounded sounded nice to me. Um, you know, I didn't admittedly do a whole lot of like listening on the quad speakers. I was really using a lot a lot of the time using headphones and everything like that. But um, so I think the display is probably one of the more interesting things because I'm sure you saw that we, we certainly talked about it on the show, but I'm sure you saw this one that Ron Amadio had his Ars Technica uh, takedown of the display where it seemed like a lot of the, the reviews were very pro display, right? Like pro this display, yeah. even though it's an LCD display and a lot of people will knock it because it's not an AMOLED or whatever, but it's 11.6 inch, 1.44 uh, Hertz LCD display. And I know mm -hmm. that developer tools thing says that the display is not good when you activate it. You get all those ugly lines that we showed off on the show a couple of weeks <laughs> yeah. ago. That was, uh, yeah, that was last week, Jason. Was, that was oh, that was, see, time yeah. is time is weird. Yep. Time um, has no meaning. It was last week. That's right. <laughs> just last week. Uh, we, we showed off those lines. But, I'm, you know, I got to say, like, again, is this a review or is it my experience? And my experience using the tablet is... Every time I turned it on and looked at the display, I really liked what I was seeing. So, yeah, does and it matter that that tool was displaying things that you you know would would otherwise not want to see? Sure, it it seems to um, it seems to prove that the display is not perfect. But my experience of using this tablet was that I really liked what I was seeing on the display every time I pulled it out. Um, it just it didn't bother me at all. There was never a time where I was looking at the display or using it and scrolling and seeing something that I was like, oh, yeah, I've seen so many better displays than this. Like I was actually pretty impressed with it. Curious to know your thoughts, yeah. Juan. I, I exactly the same boat where I, I feel our perception of a product needs to also be sort of, you need to take into account what is the expected use and who is the sort of target for something like this. Yeah. And I think OnePlus is doing something where this is a OnePlus pad. It's not a OnePlus pad plus. It's not a OnePlus pad pro. And to say like LCD bad, I mean, I, yeah. I think a lot of us would say we prefer OLEDs. Sure. That's that's fine. Yeah, but to, to slam something just because it's an LCD without really looking at its sort of comparable performance, this is a tablet that's going to sell for a pretty decent price. And I've set it next to other like three and four hundred dollar carrier tablets. You know, like the the MSRP is three or four hundred dollars, but they're the tablets you often get for free when you sign up, sign up for like a line of service. And uh, if you're complaining about the LCD here, just because it's an LCD, then you don't remember how bad LCDs really could get on inexpensive Android tablets. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I, I felt like this was uh, punching well above its price tag. And I had someone in one of the comments on my video complaining that like, oh, well, you could go and get like an iPad. And you're like, yeah, but the iPad is also using an LCD at 60 Hertz. So what, why, why are we upset about a 144 Hertz totally. LCD where, yeah, where are when the sacrifices? comparably priced tablets are, are kind of running in that same, uh, are, are, are running poorer displays than, than the one that's on this, uh, this one plus. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. You said it. You said it perfectly. I think the trade off was solid considering the cost. I mean, this tablet is $479. So you're still yeah. sub $500. You know, when you're talking about a, a, a tablet that has uh, 
excellent specs. I mean, performance wise, you've got the MediaTek Dimensity 9000 system on a chip in here, um, which again, I have to reprogram myself and my, my like legacy beliefs around MediaTek. It's, it's so easy to fall into the, the camp oh, of like, Oh, man. MediaTek bad, you know, similar to LCD bad, but I've changed my, my thinking on that because I've seen enough devices running their top of the line, uh, uh, chips and those devices perform about as good as any other device, you know, coming from the Snapdragon camp that I've, that I've become so yeah, accustomed to. And, and Dimensity 9000 was special because that was the chip that vaulted the 8 Gen 1 in performance per watt and was nipping at the heels of last year's iPhone. And when you put it in a larger chassis with a big battery and it's got better thermal management because of all the surface area, this Dimensity 9000 is a champ. I mean, I, I wouldn't really... I wouldn't really suggest people grab a tablet like this to do heavy laptop replacement work, right. but the chip is not what's holding it back. That SOC is hanging with, you know, there is no sub $500 laptop uh, selling today. Not, not like you can go and buy an old laptop for less. Right. Um, you know, you put this up against like a $400 Chromebook and this thing is an order of magnitude more powerful than what we can do with Android apps on a, on a, cheaper Chromebook. So th this yeah, is, uh, yeah. this is the media tech that changed it, Like it, it changed the game for uh media tech premium SOCs. Yep. Yep. Um, didn't really take a whole lot of camera uh, uh, pictures with a camera. Sorry. It's just but not you, something I sure, do a but, lot on a tablet. <laughs> I took, but, but you sure couldn't miss where it is though. <laughs> no, I mean, that's a, I like the look of it. I actually really yeah. like the, the look of it, especially I mean, with this case on, like it's a solid, it's a design. It's a design consistency design with the line of phones, right? If you're going to have the tablet to match the phone, you know, like when you see them both laying on the table, like no, no, mine's the one with the big black dot. That's mine. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. So no, but I, 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 I also agree. I think it doesn't look. It doesn't look like every other tablet out there, and that's a, and that's a pro in my in, in my book here, and like in terms of Agreed. how it, you know, and and you know, you want I want a, a coherent design consistency that goes across the whole line. Um, yeah, so I, I'm I'm cool with the camera as is. especially. But yeah, right I'm not really to, using a tablet to take like you know yeah, family no, pictures. I'm not, yeah. and you know, I had these two dogs at the at the house that, and they're adorable, Aww. but they were they were almost too fast for me to capture with this camera. Not there because they were. They were uh, doing tricks for for treats, I think. But um, anyways, see, you know, like that's a pretty yeah. blurry, you know, on the move picture, partially because this thing is so damn big and like it's so hard to take a picture with a tablet, period, let alone of a mm. fast moving animal. And so yeah. I'm just I, I have a hard time knocking tablets on their camera performance anymore because it's just from a usability standpoint, it's not something I ever want to actually do other than doing it to prove something on like a show or whatever. I never turn to my <laughs> tablet for pictures. now. I will say I will. I will give a use case for the camera with the tablets here that I've come to I've come to discover uh, on my own, which is my kids are in pre-K and they they have the app that they share photos with, or whatever they take videos with. And I've seen them in hand and they're doing it with a tablet. Mm -hmm. They're chasing yeah. around the kids and taking pictures with the tablet. And they're doing stuff with the tablet. So like, again, like, yes, to Jason, you know, you and I might not be taking family photos of the right. tablet, but there are use cases out there where it's like, hey, I'm using this tablet. I need to be able to take pictures. For sure. So it should be decent. Yeah. 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 I think that's fair. I, I mean, my uses are, can I take video calls? And once I've satisfied that, then that's all I really need a camera yeah. on a tablet for. But it's totally fair to say other people's sort of usage or concerns might be met by having better cameras on, yep. on their sleeve. Yep. I just uh, on a tablet like this, that's not your pri That's not most people's primary reason, I think, for for having it. So, yes, it has a camera. It is capable of taking good pictures. Um, but I just didn't, I didn't really put it to a deep test either. Battery performance though, I thought was really good. I watched the, uh, the Tetris movie, the two hour Tetris movie. Um, what did you think of it? From a, oh, I thought it was awesome. I really enjoyed right? it. It was, was so it fun. fun. It yeah. was so much fun. Um, it's a good one. But that was the first thing that I did on the tablet when I got on the airplane. I got on the airplane, I rested for a little while cause it was 6am. And then when I was done resting, I woke up. 
un, you know, opened up the tablet and watched that. And it started at a hundred percent. And by the end of the two hour movie, it was a 90%. I thought that was pretty wow. darn impressive. That's impressive. Like That's 10% great. lost in two hours of watching, you know, a, a, a movie. Um, so, you know, and, and just in general, you know, battery performance was, was pretty solid. I did a lot of gaming and a lot of movies and stuff like that, uh, on the week away. So, you know, it's 95, 10 a milliamp hour battery, 67 watt super VOOC charging. So you can get that fast charging if you have the right brick to do it. Um, does have face unlock, which I thought was okay. That's really the biometric authentication that you get on this device. That is one thing that you could ding this for, I suppose, is that there's no fingerprint sensor. So if you're looking for that, you don't have that. Um other than that, I mean, I, I think my my experience with this tablet was I'm really impressed, and especially for the price range, and especially also that this is OnePlus's first kind of go with a tablet. I think the overall package, like I really was surprised at how much I like this keyboard ca uh, case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I really enjoyed having it. I think my one my one criticism is that it doesn't it it locks only into a single viewing angle and that angle wasn't mm -hmm. always the right angle for me necessarily. But, you know, for it to pack up and it it magnetically kind of snaps together like this, so anytime I threw it in my backpack, I didn't feel like it was going to open up on me or anything like that and boop, it's out and we're good to go. I don't know. It, it's a it's a cool package. Um, it is one hundred fifty dollars to get that extra that extra keyboard. Although I think they had like a deal if you were buying them all in the beginning. I don't know if they still have that deal anymore. Yeah, they they, they aren't they aren't probably going to revisit that original sort of promo probably launch not, price because yeah. that was that was intense. It was the tablet, and then you got the keyboard for free, and then you got the stylus at half price. Oh, okay. So you could have ended up with like five hundred and thirty dollars for the whole kit for everything so you see. I don't here. think they're going to revisit that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, overall, pretty impressed with it. Um, does that kind of fall in line with with your thoughts, or do you differ in any yeah. of these categories? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm right on there with you. One, I don't think OnePlus ever gets enough credit for charging technology because yeah, they do. They're the, one of the Great only. Job. It's it's OnePlus and Motorola in the United States in North America that offer these sort of faster charging standards. So, going from 45 watt charging on a Galaxy Tab to 67 watt charging on this is a noticeable difference. When the tablet's starting to run a little low and you maybe have 10 minutes to try and top it off how much more juice you really get for plugging it in for a short period of time. Really, my biggest complaint um, wasn't really the tablet itself. I, I, I feel like we're missing just the opportunity because there's no expandable storage to maybe sell another tier. I, I think this is a tablet that starts to push into territory where you could use it for more laptopy things. It's powerful enough to be used for more laptopy things. I just wish we had more options for storage. Because at this point, 128 is still lean, even if it's only a companion computer to another computer or a, or a smartphone. Mm -hmm. I, I want a bit more space on there. Yeah, fair. Yeah, uh, uh, Burke, I just saw in Slack, you were talking about there being a delay between me swiping and the screen recognizing and scrolling. And so I was just kind of like playing around with it. And I'm like looking at the video, I'm like, I see what you mean. It looks like I'm swiping and then wait and then things happen. But when I'm looking at my tablet and doing it, it feels natural. Like it feels like it comes at the right time. So I think maybe that's a disconnect of like the perception of what we see when we're watching it versus actually interacting with it. Because because when I'm interacting with it, it doesn't feel delayed to me. Yet when I look on a screen, even though that screen probably is slightly delayed, actually. So that's probably part of the delay that I'm seeing. But anyways, um, so yeah. Cool. So the OnePlus pad, I think uh, I think they did a pretty great job right out of the gate. Four seventy nine uh, for this tablet. All those other uh, accessories that you can get if you like, but you don't have to. And I gotta say, with <laughs> you know, g given that we are moving into the year of the tablet, the year of the tablet uh, with the, the with the, with the OnePlus pad and the the much awaited uh, Pixel tablet on its way. My, I got my delivery notice; it's coming in June, so I'm very excited <laughs> to get my hands on that one. Nice, um, Juan. Do do you feel that finally we're in the year of the tablet, or do you see us turning a corner <laughs> in Android? Given given <laughs> all the commitment from Android developers, we uh, talked to the guys, you know, D Dave Burke and, and Samir Samad from uh, Android, and talked about you know you know, optimizing the operating system for large screens is, is the, is the Android audience finally ready to embrace tablets the way we've hoped since 20, 
13. <laughs> I'm hoping just because we always need the competition. For yeah. so long, I've only been yeah. recommending Galaxy tabs, not because I feel that there's any Samsung like hardware superiority, but because you could avoid Android on a larger screen and use DeX. And you would get sort of a more familiar computer experience by mm -hmm. using a Galaxy tab with DeX as the main interface. So finally, isn't it so funny? We've seen the ebb and flow. Like I remember when I first started getting into reviewing Android gear and like we'd have Asus experiments like the transformers or the pad phones. We've been trying to get Android as the background operating system, but some kind of extra computer use out of this hardware for like 15 years or not that long, but like over a decade um, that we're finally starting to kind of tap into what is the functionality developers are taking it more seriously. I think this is the good start. And, and now what's going to be interesting to see is um, iPads, I feel have been very consistent, but maybe getting a little stagnant at the same time, windows on arm has been getting really good and it can also run Android apps and Linux programs. And we still have Chrome kicking around like a good Chrome slate is a really good. So I, I feel like the big screen slate competition is going to be, is going to be really hot this year. And so uh, if there was ever a time someone was looking at, I want a companion or an in-between computer. Now I think is a really good time to shop and look at all these different options. The, the fight between OnePlus pad and pixel pad is going to be awesome. Like that is just going to be a great showdown when people really get to live with these things for a little while. Yeah. And and I want to see what it does in terms of re-energizing the Samsung line or re-energizing the other the other ones that are out there to really, you know, get the market going and people and and it all goes back to we've talked about this on the show and people, you know, a, a bit of a broken record here, but like it's all going to go back to the are the developers embracing it and creating yeah. is there a compelling use other than watching a movie or TV show or reading a book or reading a comic book or playing a game? You know, like, and, and that goes back to, you know, what you were saying, Juan, about like pushing the productivity aspect of it. Can I go on a trip yeah. and not take my laptop and take that tablet and feel confident, you know? Yeah. So, and it's going to be a challenge for reviewers because I think we've, we've gotten a little complacent because yeah. you really got to now go out there and try it. And we've gotten better apps. Microsoft 365 has improved its support for, for Android. Uh, LumaFusion coming over to Android is a huge step for content creation. So now, I mean, like all the little pieces are starting. It's not the end game, but they're starting to fall into place. But now it's on reviewers to really test that. If it's just like, oh, this tablet's $500 and all I did was watch movies on it, then you're like, well, yeah, you didn't really you really give us that. You didn't really dig into it. You didn't mm -hmm. really tell us anything. Mm -hmm. I, you can do that cheap. <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> you can you do that on the cheapest of try. tablets. Absolutely. I did a road trip. Could I really just use my OnePlus pad to get all my work done? And let's see where it struggles. And let's see where there's still gaps in that experience. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, so, and by the way, uh, Juan did, like I said, did do a review of this. So if you go to somegadgetguy.com and you can check out Juan's review of the OnePlus pad from about a month ago as well, um, which you can see right there. It's a time shifted Aww, on our hey, screen right now. That guy. But uh, we don't have a huge amount of time, but real like brief strokes on the Mavvoi Tick Watch Pro 5, which you did a review of this week. So we kind of don't want to go deep on this anyways, because we want people to watch a review, but uh, give us some, some highlights, like what, what's a, what's a good about it? And then what's not good about it? Oh, hang, hang oh, on a yeah. second, Jason. Oh. We got to oh. do, it, do it right. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Juan gets his own hardware. Oh, Woo, you're right. That. Juan's hardware shack. Oh, the hardware, go. the wearable hardware. <laughs> good <laughs> memory, Victor. There we go. Okay, so what? What's your highlights? What's your highlights on that? Uh, tick watch. So throughout all of these uh, most recent Android Wear, Wear OS kinds of shenanigans, Mobvoi has made my personal favorite hardware. Um, the one of the key aspects is getting fantastic battery life and using. I, I can try and get it right there. Oh, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, yeah, um, but I the dual it. display on, on Mobvoi is one of my favorite features because it kind of brings a low power use, but with a full readout. This entire screen has been completely redesigned for the TicWatch uh, Pro 5. All of the little watch complications, all of your heart rate, you can even program a compass into that low power screen. So all of your at a glance stuff is this passive display 
before you have to fire up the OLED. And the recent update has improved battery life. So we're now we're running the Snapdragon W5 Plus Gen 1, whatever we're calling these new chips from Qualcomm. But it is uh, noticeably faster. It's noticeably more per, uh, higher performance. But I think Mobvoi has also done a pretty good job of balancing that against extending the battery life from the last generation, the TicWatch Pro 3 series. Um, we're now running Android uh, Wear OS 3. It's technically Wear OS 3.5. Um, I'm still very disappointed in Google's software strategy because it seems like Google and Samsung are on one tier where they're giving themselves better support for things like Google Assistant. And I think they're kind of quietly letting Mobvoi and Fossil struggle with the consumer issues of using a Qualcomm chip. Because again, the, the Pixel Watch and the Samsung Watch use these Exynos SOCs. The Mobvoi and the Fossil are using Qualcomm SOCs. And uh, again, we're never going to get a clear understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. Like, no company is going to break their developer NDAs or anything like that. But you, we do see, it seems generally that the Samsung SOCs are getting better support from the company that makes this operating system. So Mobvoi and Fossil feel like they're kind of being B-teamed. Um, in this, and uh, it, it's definitely been a challenge. Mm, so I, I think for a lot of smartwatch, um, like anyone who was into Wear OS or smartwatch fans, I think there's been a lot of uh, frustration and a lot of resentment for both Fossil and Mobvoi. Fossil got Wear OS 3 on their watches sooner, and it came with a lot of teething pains, and you had to switch apps. And you can look at the Fossil website. All of their Wear OS watches have these really angry reviews on them. And then you can look at the flip side where Mobvoi never updated the TicWatch Pro 3. And they, you know, you see a lot of people are yep. frustrated. Like, Mobvoi broke their promise. They said they were going to support it, and then we never got the update. But if you look at a Pro 3, it actually has more functionality than Wear OS 3.5 on the Pro 5. Google Assistant is a little broken, but it's still there and it's still somewhat functional. The app, uh, the interactions and animations are actually faster in Wear OS 2 than they are in Wear OS 3. And those that, that kind of at a glance, that notification experience can be quicker on the older watch. So this this is the 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 frustrations I have aren't localized to just the manufacturer. I feel like Google now needs to do a better job of supporting the partners that have always been with them. Because I, I know what they had to do to get Samsung on board. They had to give Samsung something special to get them to switch over from Tizen. But if we want Wear OS to be a healthy platform of different watches in competition, this is where we need Google to kind of lead that discussion again. And I'm really worried that they're kind of they're kind of letting Mobvoi and Fossil take the brunt of the frustration from their customers. The watch itself is incredible hardware. This is what I'm going to stick with. I've used the Pixel Watch. I'm getting more than three times the battery life of a Pixel Watch with even better health tracking without having to have a Fitbit account. I mean, Mobvoi has done so much right here and improved so well over their last generation. It's just a shame that that entire conversation, I think, is getting clouded by something that might not be totally within Mobvoi's control. Yeah. And we, I mean, we've heard from so many fans of Mobvoi tick watches. Uh, it's frustrating. I, I mean, and I. And, and I think people should be frustrated, but I, I, I hope that we can, I think, I hope we can at least guide the discussion to see, like, where do we see trends? Because we don't see Mobvoi ignoring their watches. My Pro 3 is on Wear OS 2.42. It didn't launch with 2.42, so we know Mobvoi has been updating that watch. So it is getting support, it is getting attention, it is getting updates, it just never got that magical Wear OS 3. Right. So if we see those kinds of trends and those patterns of behavior, and we see... Samsung SOCs, which are not as powerful and use way more battery than Qualcomm SOCs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We see Samsung SOCs get Google Assistant and Qualcomm SOCs don't get Google Assistant. I don't think that's the fault of the companies that are using those Qualcomm SOCs, or at least not entirely, not as easy as it is to leave an angry comment on Reddit. Yeah. Right. So you many know, everyone's don't, an expert don't see on through those layers, though. Yeah. Because, the semiconductor industry, right? Yeah. Yeah. But but this is this is great hardware. I just really feel like moving into the next year, we have to expect that if you want a watch that fits your style, like if it's a fossil watch or it's a Mobvoi watch, if it's not kind of on the meta of what Google and Samsung are partnering, we almost want to treat it like it's a different product line at this point because there is no unified Wear OS. 
everyone has their own companion app. They, they got rid of the sort of support for the main Wear OS app. You don't have a unified system anymore. So really, to me, it's a little less precious. I, I really feel people should look at the style and the hardware they want first and then look, well, does this have this feature or am I worried about these updates or what about, you know, Wear OS 4 is right around the corner? And then you can kind of make your purchases, purchasing decision from there. But just as a watch, I, Mobvoi has always had my favorite hardware. I really love the battery life and the the upgrades and improvements here are fantastic. So it, it definitely is still one I feel people should consider and should try to shop. Excellent. Well, folks can find your review published mere days ago. The Mobvoi Mob Tick Watch Pro 5, the most powerful Wear OS watch. But what about updates? Dun, dun, yeah. dun. What about it, huh? What about, what about them? The question. Watch. To That's how you out. get interactions on YouTube. <laughs> yes. SEO. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Ask that's a question. prompting question for the audience to respond to. Hey, <laughs> we prompted a question last week about pixel. Uh, what was it? Pixel loyalty. And we, we got did. tons of feedback. So yeah. questions work. Yeah. <laughs> So there we go. Thank you, Juan. Uh, everybody should check out what uh, what you do, somegadgetguy.com. Over to you, Ron. Yes, we're going to ask even more questions after this quick break because we're going to thank our first sponsor for sponsoring this episode. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by Decisions. And in today's digital landscape, businesses are faced with an overwhelming number of tools and systems that are necessary to operate effectively. But managing all those disparate tools and ensuring they work together seamlessly that can be a pretty daunting task. And this is where Decisions comes in. Decisions serves as the ultimate orchestrator for IT and industry experts, providing a unified platform for businesses to manage their digital infrastructure by automating routine tasks and customizing workflows. Decisions helps businesses reduce operational costs, improve customer service, and streamline their overall processes. In a constantly evolving digital landscape where innovations happen on the fringe, adaptability is crucial to staying ahead of the game. And using a powerful no-code platform, Decisions allows both developers and business users to build applications and automations without a single line of code. With Decisions, your team can collaborate to build and adjust workflows, dynamic forms, and decision-making processes that fit your unique and ever-changing business needs. And Decisions features a robust rules and workflow engine, as well as a pre-built integrations that connect to any legacy system via API. And all of this is controllable within a simple drag and drop visual interface designer. And Decisions is amazing. I When I discovered them, I'm like, God, this is so powerful. And a great example of this is, uh, is how Decisions automation software helped No Ledger. They manage portfolios and investment activity for family accounting offices and investment firms, and they face the challenge in managing their complicated digital landscape. Decisions provided complete system integration, which allowed No Ledger to pull data from any database and communicate with every system and application in their process. This enabled a pain-free solution to managing their portfolios, streamlining operations, and improving their customer experience to keep ahead in the financial industry. Automating the small decisions frees up valuable time for your team to focus on the bigger decisions that matter your, to your business. With Decisions, you can customize workflows to automate routine tasks and reduce operational costs, all while better serving your customers. Managing a fragmented digital landscape is essential for businesses to remain competitive and successful. Decisions offers a powerful no-code solution that unifies business practices and makes managing your digital landscape easier than ever before. Discover the power of Decisions today by claiming your free demo at Decisions.com slash twit. In today's ever-changing digital landscape, managing the numerous tools and systems business, businesses need to operate can be a hurdle to growth and efficiency. Decisions no-code automation software simplifies the complexity of managing multiple systems, allowing businesses to unify their operations, reduce operational costs, and drive company growth. Learn more about Decisions no-code automation platform and claim your free demo. Visit decisions.com slash twit. That's decisions.com slash twit. And we thank Decisions for helping us make good decisions, make good workflows, and be a little more efficient. I love efficiency. Thanks, Decisions. Thank you, Decisions. Also for Hooray. sponsoring us here on All About Android. We appreciate you sponsoring with us. So thank you. <laughs> uh, all right. So continuing on this hardware cavalcade, 
um, the normal hardware, not the wearables anymore. Although we'll get to that because there is a little bit more on that front, but not quite yet. We're back to tablets now because the big tablet news from this last week that you probably didn't hear, or maybe you did, is that Amazon upgraded it's uh, it, to a biggest, uh, it's big. Let me try that again. Amagra, Am I can't even talk anymore. Amagon. Amagon. <laughs> Amagon. I kind of like that. Amazon introduced its biggest tablet yet. There we go. The Amazon More Fire tablets. Max 11. And it's interesting to talk about the Fire Max 11 following on the heels of the one plus pad review because in some ways it's similar i suppose it's 11 inch 2000 by 1260 hertz lcd display so see you got the lcd but you got the lower refresh on this one it is a mediatek processor but it's an mt8188 system on a chip which is a much lower uh lower scale <laughs> lower what do you want to call it ranking uh not not as nearly as performant let's just put it that way four gigs of ram 64 gigs of storage i think you can upgrade to 128 if you like a nine watt charge out of the box, which is very slow. It does have a fingerprint sensor on the side. It does have micro SD card expansion. Uh, so you get those things. Uh, eight megapixel front and back camera. I guarantee you those are not very good cameras. $229.99. So we know Amazon produces incredibly inexpensive hardware when it comes to their tablet line because they've got the whole content side of things that they're trying to uh, to boost. So they cut the cost on the hardware. So you'll hopefully buy a lot of their you know their their content. Two twenty nine is a far cry from four seventy nine. I think is what it was for the OnePlus uh, Pad. Is it for yeah four seventy nine? Um, so they're kind of in different categories entirely, but, uh, so there's that. But I think what, what also kind of brings it closer to what we were talking about the, with the one plus pad are the accessories it has a productivity bundle. So if you pay three twenty nine ninety nine, you get the tablet, you get a keyboard case that again has the pogo pins and the magnetic, uh, attachment to, uh, to kind of, you know, attach it all together. It's a case, no backlit keys, similar to what the one plus pad has. I have no idea about the quality of the keys or, or anything like that on the, on the keyboard attachment, but there you go. And then it also has a stylus, which, I saw very little written about, <laughs> just that it's there. <laughs> so I imagine the stylus probably does little more than uh, than act as if it were your finger. Um, it probably does a little bit more than that. But anyway, that stylus sure is in that photo that we're looking at on the video here. Uh, this is there a, it is on the side. But it does actually yeah, no. magnetically snap to the side of the tablet. So I mean, similar to the OnePlus Pad. You know, that's got to be table stakes now with t with styluses and tablets, right? Like once that, once they started doing the magnetic snap on, like if your doesn't have it, you then then you got a question. It's way better. I think it's way less expensive. I'm guessing to do that than it is to house it inside of the tablet. You yeah. know, <laughs> it's probably a, a lot more of a pain in the butt to find a you know to to fashion that in from a hardware perspective. Are you amazed, Juan Bagnell, at the Fire Max 11? What do you think? Uh oh, uh oh, we, we're muted. What is it, it, I mean, it really does seem like less than half the tablet for less than half the price of yeah. a OnePlus pad or a Pixel tablet. And, and kind of to Ron's point, I worry in, in the reviewer space because tablets keep occupying this mind space of being the solution in search of a problem. And the problem is usually I want to watch my movie on a bigger screen. So people keep trying these really inexpensive tablets and then the experience isn't that great. I mean, it still plays the movie and you can kind of play a couple, you know, cheap mobile games on it. But to try and convey, like, what is the experience of using this at like 229 versus using a OnePlus pad at 479? Yeah, it, 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 that's a that's a conversation of nuance. And and like Ron was saying, like, I, I wonder if we'll get developers on board. If this is the year of tablets and the market gets flooded with these like sub three hundred dollar, you know, mid pack two hundred dollar tablets, I feel like that in the long term can do damage. Like consumers are not going to like these experiences, and then you end up just sort of reinforcing why I guess you should only buy an iPad because they just work. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, like Ron, what when when you see something like this, if you were working with developers, how do we make software for that? lowest common denominator 
kind of performance? Like, how do we make a good experience for someone out of something this inexpensive? If I had the answer, I probably would be making a lot more money. I know we'd be in way for industry. I mean, I, I appreciate your faith in my opinion there, but uh, I, I don't have the 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 uh, the crystal ball to figure that out. But um, but I, I the, the funny thing is, is that I was I was about to make a whole deal about how like here we are, you're the tablet. Look, even Amazon's getting into it. But like honestly, Amazon's been flying this flag along with Samsung yeah. longer than Forever. anybody really. Yeah. And like yeah. and the and the thing is, is that like. I'm, I, you know, being the parent of toddlers, you know, and having other friends with parents of toddlers, I see a lot of fire tablets in those kids' hands. I do you know too. I, mean? like, I just know, saw it at the airport, actually. I saw tons yep. of fire tablets in kids' hands yep. because they so, are expensive so. and because kids are like, are, are you know prone to just dis- drop and destroy things so at yeah. least if they're going to drop and destroy and also kids really don't have high exp or high needs right kids are just going to watch something or play that really low um low uh right effort not well, effort but my, games that don't require a lot of processing that's what i mean my, my daughter's seven and now she's starting to get a little snobby about whether or sure. not she can use daddy's Love steam it. deck Love so it. <laughs> It's, yeah. I, I maybe I maybe did that wrong. I maybe should have kept her expectations a little lower. But I, I feel like for Android, we've got to make the good argument um, based on price, performance, practicality in the middle. Because in in my neighborhoods, it's like what you guys are saying. It's it's either something really cheap and disposable, something yeah. they got from a carrier or a Fire tablet. Or there are affluent families in my neighborhood where those kids are on iPad Pros, and there's almost yeah. nothing in between. Yeah. So the the notion of like a four to five hundred dollar tablet seems strange. You either need the really high performance gaming, you know, pro tablet or you need something completely disposable. Mm. And I think that's what Google is actually going to have to step in and say, like, here are good reasons where we've got a practical price to performance and it solves these issues. And I don't think we can let that conversation just go up for everybody's personal interpretation. I think we need some companies to lead the way. And say, like, this is what we're trying to do. I think Google's doing something smart with um, making their tablet into a smart display, into a, like a smart speaker, smart display. Mm-hmm. I think OnePlus is doing something really smart, really focusing on stylus and keyboard. But it's going to take a lot to get the message out there to consumers why we have these different options to do different things and why yeah. in the middle of the tablet market, it might make sense to spend some cash. All good questions. I mean, all good points, all good questions as we just as we as we enter this new frontier of tablets and tablet lands. Um, you I want it to be to a it. new frontier in tablet lands so bad, don't you? Ron? I do. I really I'm, I'm willing and I'm manifesting <laughs> yeah. it. But, you are. Um, but but in terms of manifesting, we can kind of switch gears a little bit. We can manifest the uh, Google Pixel 8 Pro um, as the. We're, you know, we're weeks away from IO uh, and now the rumors are starting up again. You know, so it's just time. It's just a few, few short months until October when we get into the uh, hardware announcements phase of Google. Um, but so some rumors about the Pixel 8 Pro that apparently has an additional sensor on the back for measuring temperature. Oh, Interesting. that's different. So this is this is an IR temperature sensor. Um, and you might remember that Dave Burke and Matthew McCullough from Google both said one of their favorite things about Android 14 is the Health Connect becoming part of the, of the OS. Yeah. Um, and so this could be an indicator of a big tentpole feature that taps into that. Um, but if anything, it shows that Google doesn't, you know, they're trying new things in the phone designs themselves. Um, and additionally, alongside the Pixel 8 that we're expecting this fall, um, the, the currently unannounced Pixel Watch 2 is expected to launch. Um, and Google, uh, 9 to 5 Google got some specs uh, for the unannounced watch, which is, you know, which came first, the the announcement of the watch or the specs, you decide. <laughs> um, but so they, they say for, it's from the, the first gen's Exynos proce- processor to a Snapdragon processor in the next version. Uh, the W5, oh. uh, W5 Plus Gen 1 is the one that launched in the TicWatch Pro 5 one. That could be the mm-hmm. one. Um, this would largely impact battery life on the wearable for the better. Uh, the Pixel Watch 1 was rated at 24 hours with AOD off. Uh, this update is expected to deliver more than one day of battery with AOD on. Um, so nice. there you go. That would be a and big deal. Si- yeah. It would be. And yeah. they'll have si- similar sensors as the Fitbit Sense 2, including continuous, continuous 
electrodermal activity sensor for tracking sweat secretion, uh, which is helpful for stress management tracking, which is what I would turn off if I had that watch because I don't want anyone to tell me how stressed <laughs> I am. Um, uh, and again, this all could tie into the big reason why Android 14 Integrated Health Connect is something that people at uh, Google are very excited about. Uh, Juan, what do you think of a uh, of a te uh, IR temperature sensor on a phone? Do you think the 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 breadcrumbs we've laid towards Health Connect are correct, or is there another usage that we're not thinking of? Yeah. Well, I, there's a part of me that wonders if maybe the initial conversations on these didn't start happening sort of at the peak of the scariest part of the pandemic. Yeah, it seems we know that a way. phone can take like a year and a half to sort of build. Totally, and that was when we were all doing the the initial like health tracking. Uh, the virus spread tracking everywhere you would go. Someone would like scan your forehead yep. as you're dropping my daughter off at school. Oh, yeah. um, but then there are other applications that we can use sensors like that for. So really, I just hope it's one of those things that if this is Google playing around with something, that's fine. We get it for a year. Maybe it doesn't really materialize. But I would really love to see them stick the landing on a feature like this and continue iterating and supporting it and making that unique to Pixel. Yeah, and see if anyone agreed. else tries to copy them yep. for bringing that feature in. I, I had not caught that Pixel Watch rumor. If the Pixel Watch gets this new chip, and maybe that helps shake up the relationship between Qualcomm and the other partners and getting Google Assistant working on Qualcomm-powered watches, that would be a good get for Pixel fans. Mm -hmm. A Pixel Watch powered by this hardware would be very good news. This is a, a very good chip to power a portable. So I'll be really excited to see if that's where Pixel Watch 2 goes. Why is Google not not creating its own processor for its wearables? That's so interesting. So uh, the, 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 yeah. you would probably want to tap someone like uh, Dr. Ian Cutris. Um, I, I rip off a lot of what I know about the silicon industry from Dr. Ian at Tech Tech Potato. Uh, but Google is really good at designing the framework and the machine learning components and uh, honing the uh, image signal processing, the ISP on your camera hardware. But when you look at a Tensor, they're using Samsung components for the individual cores, and then they're building sort of the neighborhood that those cores exist in. I don't think it'll be much longer before Google really starts looking at designing their own individual cores and components. I think we're getting pretty close because the rest of this is where a, a pixel is really, really strong. Like mm -hmm. the machine learning hardware is phenomenal. The camera processing, the image processing is amazing. And I feel like they're kind of held back by using other people's CPUs and GPUs. So I think they're getting really close. And once that happens on like a phone, I think we're just a, a, a half step away from them looking at those indi individual components for wearables. And then that impacts everything. That impacts Pixel Watch, right. that impacts Fitbit. That could be really cool. Interesting. And I don't think you're far off from there. I mean, it makes sense because you don't want to, you know, and Google, Google's approach, at least with hard release with Tensor, Tensor is like dip their feet in, you know, dip their toe in the water, get some success, build up some stuff and then move to the next mm -hmm. thing. It's a slow and progressive path, but that's the path they've oh, been yeah. going until they cancel it all and, and, and uh, stop the program. <laughs> but um, as Google is wont to do, as Google's want to do. Yeah, exactly. So we'll see. So. <laughs> <laughs> Scooter X in <laughs> chat says, apply directly to the forehead. What was that brand? There, there, there was a brand. Head on. Yes, that's it. Pixel Head 8. On, yeah. yeah. Pixel 8. Apply directly to the forehead. Apply directly to the forehead. With the temperature sensor. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, yes, I'd be very curious to see Google stick to one of those fancy different you know, features. Yeah. And uh, maybe that one's accessible and generic enough. I say generic, even though we haven't really seen that very much, but, um, but it's, but it's a, it's generic more than say a sensor in your phone that allows you to skip the tracks by waving your hands like this. Like that's just, I will still fight you on that. Jason, <laughs> the, 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 the Z camera was so good at waking the phone up before you were handling it. Yeah, that's you true. Had your pixel I do remember up, that. Get you go reach your hand out to pick it up. Reach and, for and it. It's like already there. Yeah, totally. That's true. Unlike an iPhone, you didn't have to lift it. It was already face unlocking right. before before you'd even touch it. That's and right. I still feel like that was the primary and they that tried to the do primary. something else silly with it. Yeah. Um, but, but I wish they'd kept it. It was just really expensive hardware to streamline 
one face on the totally no I, I completely agree <laughs> like with you by myself the way. up on that yeah. yeah i totally agree with you it's easy to make fun of that technology for the silly other things it did but i yeah. really appreciated the face unlock um speed up you know it was that, that so fast for it was face super unlock. fast it was really great it, it's like it knew you wanted to do that before you did uh and so i thought that was handy um, and then finally, as for Google's unreleased phones that didn't make it, um, we probably on this show at one point, at least checking in on rumors leading up to the Pixel Fold release, had talked about the possibility or the fact at one point, I'll use that in air quotes because no rumors are fact until they're <laughs> proven, but um, that there were two foldables that Google was working on that. The Pixel Fold was just one in a small family that there was possibly going to be a flip to go along with it. And sure enough, Google head of design for hardware products, Ivy Ross confirmed that a second foldable was in the works. They held it back because quote, it's not good enough yet. Uh, it's not, you know, entirely clear if that means it, what does the yet mean? Is this a device that we're going to see at some point? Is Google going to come out with a flippable? Uh, if that it was indeed what that phone was, I think it's, interesting that the fold was the one that hit the market yet when we look at the example that samsung sets samsung is much more um much more successful from a sales perspective with their flip series than they are with their fold series probably part of that is the the exorbitant cost of the fold versus the flip <laughs> but the flip four accounted for 60 percent of its foldable sales in europe versus the z fold four um, sorry, the Flip 4 accounted for 60%. The Z Fold 4 accounted for 40%. So uh, interesting that, you know, what what would have happened if, if Google had released the Flip before the Fold? I, I think the Fold is, is interesting, but the Flip is probably the device that I'd be more likely to, like, actually pay money for personally. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting because you, you I, I'm... I'm with you, Jason, but then I mean, people who is the reverse, right? Yeah. It's I think it's literally six of one, half a dozen of the other. Yeah. Um, Juan, which form factor would you prefer from Google in terms of a foldable? Man, see, I'm I'm real torn because this whole year for me, I know everyone's talking of tablets, but it's been a camera year, like all of the new uh -huh. exciting camera technologies, and we don't get those on flips or folds. Yeah, that's true. So uh, I, I I'm probably going to slow play this year for foldables just because of the, the camera focus. But this is one of those crazy philosophical arguments. And I feel like Samsung did it right with the Z Flip because it is, it is immediately more recognizable as a phone that just folds in half and can be a little bit smaller in your pocket. And I feel it's only up to now. We're only just starting, like we've been saying with tablets this entire time, we're only just starting to figure out Android on a larger canvas. So a folding tablet that turns into an awkward and thick phone is only just starting to realize its potential. Mm -hmm. And we've got a ways to go mm -hmm. in polishing up that experience. So I kind of feel like, Jason, I, I feel like we're probably going to be more successful impressing people, making the statement, like Samsung said, the Z Flip is a statement phone, um, because that's more familiar. It, it's mm -hmm. a phone. It, it does the phone things that we always expect it to do. Yep. Now we've got to win the hearts and minds. Well, what can you do with a larger screen? What can you do with a tablet? And why would you want to fold the tablet up to put that in your pocket? So I think that's a bigger uphill challenge. Um, I, I, I really, I mean, again, we'll never get the inside scoop on this, but um, I really feel Google probably made the targeted decision to look at like Android 12 to 12 L to 13. We're focused on this multitasking split screen. Larger we're getting good factor. information from yeah. we're getting good information from Samsung and Microsoft contributing to the development of Android 13. I feel like that's probably why they focused on making their first foldable a tablet. And yeah. then maybe they'll come back and revisit it because I don't think it's going to be nearly as big a, a software challenge to come back and do a flip style phone because it's basically just a pixel and you add the extra little pieces of code to give you some of the fun features like a flex mode style experience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's still a pixel. Mm -hmm. Like we it's know how to make that yeah. phone. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good point. Very astute. Really good point. Yeah. It all comes together. Yep. Um, okay. Well, we do have other types of news in today's show. In fact, we've got some really interesting app news coming up next. So don't go anywhere. But first, 
let's talk a little bit about what we do here at Twit because we create content for you, uh, oh, person who is as interested and uh, kind of in, enthused by technology as we are. That's why we do what we do. Hopefully, we're giving you the information that you need, the knowledge you need to understand and use the technology that you have in today's world. That's kind of our goal. That's what we're always striving to do. Uh, in order to do that, we create partnerships. You hear about some of these partners on the shows, sponsors, uh, trusted brands, and uh, we make introductions between you our audience with those partners. That's kind of what we facilitate. That also keeps keeps the lights on and keeps, keeps the business rolling. So if you are in a position to uh, market your brand and you haven't thought about podcasting, you really need to think about it. Keep your brand in front of your target audience. Continue to grow and we can help you do that. At Twit, we deliver powerful host read ads similar to what I'm doing right now, although this is for us, but uh, by tech experts, According to Nielsen, 56% of podcast listeners pay more attention when a host reads an ad on their show instead of playing some pre-recorded thing. I know when I'm listening to a podcast and it breaks away to a pre-recorded thing. I don't know. I just, I never enjoy it as much. I actually like hearing about these, um, you know, these different services and, and stuff through the mouth of the person that I'm already listening to, right? Spending a half an hour of my life listening to their show. I trust that more. And we provide, we pride ourselves on delivering the information that's relevant to our audience as well. 72% of our listeners have a job function directly related to technology. 87% are involved in the tech and IT decisions at those companies. So they're making these decisions. We have top earners listening to our shows. Overall, 66% of our audience earns over $100,000 annually. 23% earns over $200,000. So we've got powerful uh, decision-making people uh, with, <laughs> with money at, the, at these companies to spend. Partnering with Twit means that you're going to get the gold standard in advertising. You get all of our amazing services, full service continuity team supporting everything from copywriting to graphic design, embedded ads. Those are unique ads every time. Guarantee over delivery on impressions. We make that guarantee. Onboarding services and detailed reporting offered free of cost to direct clients. Courtesy commercials that are shareable so you can share those on social media and landing pages and a whole lot of other free perks and gifts like mentions in our newsletter that's sent to thousands of fans, recession bonuses, uh, social media promotion, value add on shows you didn't even have to purchase. And we have a lot of, you know, uh, we've had a lot of partners that came from being listeners uh, of Twit. Founder of Things Canary, Haroon Mir says, we expected Twit to work well for us because we were longtime listeners who over the years bought many of the products and services we learned about on various shows. We were not disappointed. The combination of the very personal ad reads and the careful selection of products that Twit largely believes in gives the ads an authentic, trusted voice that works really well for products like ours. 10 out of 10, we'll use again. We appreciate that. Thank you, Haroon. Uh, our listeners, as you know, because you're listening, are highly intelligent, they're heavily engaged, they're tech savvy. And so if you're ready to elevate your brand, that's why I'm telling you all this. So you can launch your campaign today, break out of the advertising norm, grow your brand by giving an authentic introduction of your products and services to a qualified audience by experts you trust. So check out what we have to offer. And if you go to twit.tv slash advertises, actually, uh, what Victor is showing right now, you can see all of this and more. That's twit.tv slash advertise. And uh, check it out. We've, uh, we've worked with a lot of companies. We've brought a lot of really wonderful products to our listeners and viewers. And we can do the same for you. Twit.tv slash advertise. And we think, thank you for... Uh, listening to me taking a few minutes talking about how cool we are you know because we're cool what can i say all right with that it's time to get into some app uh app news i've been uh -oh. looking forward to this block there's some cool stuff in here uh oh <laughs> and two buckle out of three up. of these i immediately thought of you ron when i saw the headlines <laughs> buckle up my friends buckle up so uh, if you listened a couple of weeks ago, you heard me, uh, I, I had a, I had one of my patented rants about YouTube music and its integration of podcasts 
and uh, water podcast the track. air quotes. You can hear those fingers not. swooshing through the air. I know yeah, exactly. <laughs> so but weird. um, but but Juan, I don't, I don't know if you know, but the, currently right now, the way YouTube Music uh handles podcasts is you need to make a video version of your audio podcast and upload that. Also known as just uploading a video. Sorry, a, a video. <laughs> I, I know that feel, though. I understand that feel. It drives me crazy, but it they've gets been better, Rod. It gets better. And does it though, Jason? Does it though? Really? No. What I'm I mean, it gets you, better. Question that. The worsenedness gets better. Yes, like it the gets more. I guess so. <laughs> so I've actually made my my distaste for this uh, known to some people I know at YouTube. It has some conversations, so I, I've I've known that this is coming. Um, as several other people, they've they've been I've I've took I've taken part in like a, a product kind of showcase type thing uh, through nice. my work, and they share the fact that they are going to add RSS uh, integration, which is great. That's all we want. We're podcasters. We love RSS. Give it to that. That um, well, they've started a limited pilot preview with quote unquote key strategic partners um and uh this is how they've chosen to implement podcasts oh, wow. and rss it's not the <laughs> traditional route that no, we're all used to um but basically they they only offer they i'm sorry they don't offer pass through meaning rss is for ingestion only so what it means is that you you submit your rss feed youtube music ingest your file and your metadata from that and then at that point YouTube hosts the file, which means that your podcast host mm. that you use does yeah. not get any data or statistics about how many people listen or in this case watch um, that podcast episode. So all they're using RSS for is for uploading the podcast to YouTube. Wow. Let that sink in for a second. Let that yeah. sink in. Um, the other, the other, the other things about this actually make sense. Um, they require podcast uploading via RSS to not include to, to not include quote unquote regular ads, i.e. meaning feeds must have, must be ad free. Um, so if you have dynamic insertion or things like that, or like, or like pre-recorded ads, like Jason was just talking about, uh, it cannot have those. It needs to be the core source, no ads inserted, uh, feed. However, sponsored segments can be included if marked properly, which is similar to how YouTube works, right? You can't have ads in your video, but you can have sponsored segments and that sort of thing. Um, and YouTube will crawl those RSS feeds every five minutes, which is just a waste of server resources because all you're doing is <laughs> uploading an episode. Gosh. So for some reason, it, it's like, I just don't understand. It's 2023. We've been doing this for almost 20 years. It is one of the few technologies and platforms that everybody agrees and everybody is committed to. This is how podcasts work. RSS, we figured out the IAB has gotten involved. We figured out dynamic ad insertion and YouTube just they they have to do it their own way and it it just drives me bananas drives me absolutely bananas as a podcaster this sounds so, really aggressive I, to me <laughs> yes. what do you think Juan? <laughs> no i i completely share his frustrations cuz again it's like we 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 solved these problems yep. and i don't know that google's implementation of this is bringing anything to the table that is a benefit to the people who would want to sort of interact with their audiences Google's, you know, sort of a priority, whatever their algorithm is focused on has been an ebb and flow of frustration. When I got started, it was all about long form video. Then they wanted shorter videos. Now it's like shorts and reels. Now yeah. they're also trying to capitalize on podcasts. But when I would upload podcasts to my channel, that watch time would absolutely harm my metrics. And yeah. I'd get all the angry red down arrows. It is so frustrating trying to get a bead on what Google expects of all of the people that supply YouTube with content. And a, a move like this, like on its surface, that should be good. I can now integrate this. I can bring one service to another, hopefully overlap some audience. But again, with it being on YouTube's terms for stuff like this, it's just gonna create more work for me. Yep. And I'm not entirely sure what the benefit will be. And and that's the thing is that like ultimately you have having to have multiple sources to 
calculate and add up your views and your listens or your downloads oh, yeah. or whatever you want to do is a nightmare. And basically YouTube's metrics and, and the things that YouTube does count are different than the way podcasts are, are counted or aggregated. Oh, yeah. And so they're not going to be participating in that. And so all those standards and all that stuff that we went through in the great data migration, anybody who's been a podcaster in the past 20 years about, I want to say maybe like seven or eight years ago, watched their downloads. Like if you had a podcast that was getting 20,000 downloads Within the span of like two years, it went from 20,000 to 8,000 because the IAB mm -hmm. and all the ad agencies and the podcast hosts all colluded and got together and said, how can we, how can we advance, how can we give the advantage to advertisers and not to the actually independent podcasters, which, which is a whole other topic I could uh, get upset about. <laughs> but, um, but so now whatever standard that people, that podcasters that, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm a, I'm a disgruntled podcaster who didn't have a seat at the table, but, um, <laughs> uh, and I don't like it when like 20 people get together and make decisions that affect my business, but um, YouTube won't participate in that, won't align with that, won't work with that, which is just frustrating. And it all boils down to the last rant I did on this, which is that YouTube music isn't actually using podcasts all they're doing is using podcast content to feed what monetizes best on YouTube, which is video. Yeah. Yep. First and foremost, that's all it is. Yep. It's another advertising business-based decision on the shoulders of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of podcasters who've been committed to this format for almost 20 years. So the only silver lining I, I can kind of point to is with Google making a move like this, which is going to be frustrating and is going to be more work for the actual content creators. It's at least Google stepping into an arena which will prevent, I feel, too, 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 too much localization from companies that are all trying to corner podcasting. Yep. Like podcasting is this beautiful, democratized, open system of sharing content and subscribing to content. And it always makes me anxious when like Apple or Spotify or a player is getting a little too powerful in the space yep. for how they can cut contracts with individual mm -hmm. creators. Yeah. I feel like this is going to be a massive pain for someone who runs a podcast my size. Like I do not run a large podcast. I talk about tech politics. That is not a super <laughs> popular version of niche. content, <laughs> but it's what I want to talk about. Um, this at least prevents too much of a focus on one platform being sort of the de, de facto podcast standard. Yeah, but it but is. I, I I really wish Google weren't doing it like this. Yeah, it, it, it's it's it, that's a big yeah, but it's it's at, at yes. what cost are they doing it at? Um, For sure. I don't know. You say like in the cousin of John in the chat was saying how how is what Google doing do compared to what Spotify does with their sort of podcast wall garden? You know, at least Spotify is playing in the confines of the podcasting world, right? You can, anybody mm -hmm. can take an RSS feed and add it to Spotify and have right. access to it and stuff like that, right? It's, you know, it's just that Spotify is choosing to pump money into the likes of Joe Rogan and other people and driving an advertising network. And I will, I will completely and happily, um, uh, divulge or what's the word or what's the disclaim or whatever that I earn money from Spotify, Spotify's advertising network. Like my podcast is monetized via their ad network and dynamic ads are fed into my podcast. Your that other, way. So your other happy, podcast. Yeah. Yeah. My other podcast, right. not this one, my, my other podcast, I fanboy does it do that way. So like, I'm happy to make that money. That's great. Um, guaranteed. I'm going to make more money there than I'm ever going to make on YouTube. Yeah. Right. Because the, the, the economies of scale on YouTube to actually because five bucks says they're not adjusting the CPMs on podcasts the way they should. Right. They're treating them just <laughs> like videos. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very right. true. Yep. Yeah. It's interesting what you said, Juan. It was a perspective um, that I hadn't considered where there's the encouragement for contact content creators to have their podcast on YouTube, but the engagement with a podcast and, and the, you know, especially longer form podcast is going to be way different than what yeah. you as a content yeah. creator are targeting on a shorter form, you know, a review, a 10 minute review versus a 90 to 120 minute podcast. Yeah. Just think of, it's, I just hadn't considered how a podcast has the potential to completely wipe out or, or, you know, completely derail. It, it, it skews, it skews your metrics. Yeah. And, and I, I had to have that sort of reckoning with what little interaction I've ever had with like YouTube account managers and stuff was, uh, to, to basically just pull my podcast off of my YouTube channel. Yeah. Like there, re it really wasn't bringing anything to me. YouTube's metrics were saying, Hey, this is like, 
a failure of a podcast. And yet whenever I engage with people on other platforms, the podcast does pretty well, but it just looked bad compared to my other main YouTube videos, like yeah. the, the main yeah. focus of YouTube. So man, it's, it's this constantly moving target that we're always trying to adapt to and anticipate. And then Google really doesn't help you. There's there's no good strategizing unless you're one of those rare, like, you know, multiple million subscriber kinds of channels like the outreach is is very minimal. Yep. So a move like this, like I, I really want to take Google on that step and give it a try and say, hey, maybe I can bring my podcast, the audio of it back to YouTube. But, it's but not I don't audio. trust. Yeah. But I don't trust that it's not going to harm my channel. Again. Yeah, right. <laughs> it will. It will. Guaranteed it will. It's so yeah. frustrating. It's so frustrating. Yeah. So. Ugh, well, sorry. well, I knew that would get you worked up, Ron. I knew. And there, yep. there's more. <laughs> there's more coming that, uh, that you can Oh, there's more coming. I know. About. Yeah, I know. Uh, but yep. before we get there, um, Apple just released something to Android before it's some, well, some of its own devices, uh, sort of. Apple Music Classical was released back in March, if you remember, for iPhone only at the time. This is like a version of Apple Music that is created around classical music. It's a kind of a different app entirely. Um, now the Android app is out and it actually came out before iPad optimization. It came out before the release of a Mac app and it came out before CarPlay support. So was that a win for Android or what? I, I don't know. Um, but it's really not that impressive when you think of the fact that it's actually very similar to when Apple acquired Beats Music. Um, Apple had acquired Prime Phonic, which was the app. Uh, that created a lot of this that Apple acquired and is kind of rolling that in, that into uh, the app itself. And so I think it's it's one of those situations where Apple is replacing what was already there. They finally got their app going uh, for Android. And so it's out. But, you know, us Android people, we're so beat down by Apple. We'll take anything. You know, we'll take we'll take any wins we can. So you mean you don't have a uh, CarPlay support, but we have an Android app, Apple. So, yay, I suppose, sort of one st one step forward, <laughs> one and a half steps back. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> There were, oh, okay. Man. Yeah, maybe if there were like three, <laughs> three people applauding, if you had that sound effect, it'd be like, yeah, there it is. Uh, well, in the other app news, my other favorite thing I was watching was the uh, much ballyhooed launch of Max, the rebranded uh, streaming service uh, formerly known as HBO Max. Um, so last week I was enjoying it. And this is just very, very funny. And then I'll share what my experience with it was. Um, so uh, in changing it from HBO Max to Max, what they did was the shortcut button on some Android TV remotes that had the HBO Max button in it are now broken uh, because that button is hardwired or hard coded to specifically point to the HBO Max app, which has been shut down. And as part of the rebrand, they did not just rebrand and re-update that app. They launched a new app, the new Max app. So if you were an HBO Max customer, you had to uninstall the old HBO Max and install the new Max app. Oh but apparently those buttons on those remotes haven't been updated oh. yet. I don't know even though they can update them. <laughs> I hope so, because right now it's just a pointless button that does nothing. Um, and this is just one example of the bumpy transition. I don't know why they launched a new app. I suppose it's because they changed the company that if you look at it, it was from a different developer and might've been money, like yeah. a bunch, bunch of different reasons why they could do it. As far as I can tell, the app is the same, um, just with a different, you know, kind of cosmetic look and different content, obviously with the discovery, discovery plus content. But what was funny was that when you open the HBO max app, uh, on the day it launched, it gave you a, just a one screen saying HBO Max is done. Go install the new Max app. And you had to go install it. I did it on my phone. Worked fine. I tried it on the browser. Worked fine. I went to my uh, uh, Google TV and I uninstalled the HBO Max, installed the Max app. How many times can I say the word Max, by the way, in this bit? <laughs> Max, um, Max, Max, Max. But so I installed the, the Max app and did not work. It prompted me to create a password, even though I had an active subscription and it worked on my phone. Right. It, the Google TV app just w thought I was a new user and just was giving me broken, like, st like style sheet broken modal that like obviously oh, did not pass QA. Like, I don't know what they're thinking. What I had to do is I had to go unsubscribe on Google Play on the browser and resubscribe. And that's the only Whoa. way I got the Google TV thing to work again. So, um, 
Bump, I, I, that was me, and I'm. I like to think I'm fairly tech savvy. Yeah. Um. If that was me having those problems, <laughs> I, I wonder how many people just you know bailed or didn't even bother. Yeah. Totally. So. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah. I, so thankfully, on uh, so on our uh, Google TV on our Chromecast, yeah. um, we installed the new Max app before we uninstalled the HBO Max ah. app, and it seemed to to transfer us over. Um, yep. But I had a lot of I, I, nothing like what you were describing, but I had teething pains on my phone with it not recognizing my password, um, switching uh, the app on my phone. So yeah. I this this entire thing, same, same. I have no I, I cannot understand why we're looking at a completely because it, it's like a completely different app bucket. Yeah. Even if you were changing the entire app, I don't understand why that couldn't have been an update process mm. yep. as opposed to a totally separate line of software. And I think this is going to be very frustrating for a lot of people out there. Yep. And the button, the button that the does button, nothing when button. you push it. Button. Ugh. Stupid button. <laughs> Buttons that don't work just, mm. yep. nothing's mm. worse. That's the problem. That's the problem with those hard coded things. And those, this yeah. is why, you know, like, do, yeah, 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 this yeah is, don't, don't ever give me a button with a brand on it because at some yeah. point that button's going to, you know, there's going to be a reason <laughs> gonna know, they're going to change yeah. the logo and they're going to be like, I know that's not the same Netflix logo as they have now. Yeah. Like it's, <laughs> or they're going to change the functionality and then you can't yeah. do anything with it. Just give me a button that has a little like nondescript dot on it and let me Pick the app for yep. that button. Labeled buttons are just e-waste waiting to happen. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yep. Yeah. Yes, I yeah, blame you, point. Android TV or HBO Max. I don't even know who to blame at this point, but I blame someone. I think I'm going to blame HBO Max. <laughs> okay. Blame HBO Max. Yes. Yeah. We, <laughs> but they somebody, are deserving. But Absolutely. but somebody made the remote with the button and said, hey, we need to find a brand to buy this button. Nah, so I they're, still blame them. You, you still blame the ones that bought it, not the I'm ones that made it. Blame the people on it. Yeah, this, it's their mess they started. Come on, the button. Mess. Don't blame the poor remote re remote maker, the guy who made the button. He's just doing what he was told. Oh, that's so. true. That's true. Because they're like, yeah, what? What? what, what are they going to change the app this point, Sue? That's never going to happen. No, right? I like, mean it's, it's HBO. Like, they're not going to change anything. Like, why would they do that? Not going anywhere. Doesn't make yeah. They're not going anywhere. It's HBO. <laughs> Anyways, hey, we have an Android intelligence tip from our good friend J.R. Ray Feel, and it is about this week uh, an app that I'm not using very much, if at all, anymore because I moved to Spotify. But YouTube Music, maybe you're using YouTube Music. Here's some tips. Greetings, one and all. Hope everyone had a delightful holiday weekend. If you're here in the U.S. and you were observing it. I don't know about you, but me, I'm, I'm still a little sleepy. So today, why don't we keep it light and breezy, tackle some fun, simple, hidden shortcuts for rocking out to, oh, Warrant or Right Said Fred. I don't know, whatever it is you listen to on your favorite Android device. So, okay, Google's YouTube Music app is kind of the de facto default music service for Android these days, right? And yes, indeedly, it's got some sweet invisible step savers for your Android audio adventures. First, the next time you're listening to a track and seeing his cover art in the center of your screen, try double tapping on the left or right of that image. You never know it, but just like in the regular YouTube app, that action will skip you back or forward 10 seconds in whatever is actively playing. Next, in that same part of the YouTube music interface, swipe your finger to the left or right. That'll zap you back or forward an entire track in your current album, queue, or playlist. And finally, from that same full screen playing view, swipe your finger downward. That'll take you back a step into whatever screen you were viewing within the app most recently. See, I told you, short, sweet, and simple, but oh, so splendidly satisfying. Hey, speaking of which, if you love shortcuts as much as I do, don't miss out on my free Android Shortcut Super Course. It's a week-long e-course filled with all sorts of awesome Android sorcery, just tons and tons of tucked away step savers for practically every part of your Android using journey. 
Just head over to androidintel.net slash twit and scroll to the bottom of the page to get started and get your first lesson now. Completely free for you. That site, again, is androidintel.net slash twit. <sighs> That's it for today. Time now to nap. Where, where is he going? <laughs> I'll see you next week. <laughs> it was, look, it was a long a weekend. I know. <laughs> not, yeah, not I, felt, to, I felt that sigh. Aww. I'll give him. Aww. I'll give him credit for uh, wearing a great Ash Jeeves T-shirt there. Yeah, yes, I was. Yeah, I was just yeah. gonna say. I know. That is some vintage interneting right yep. there. Well bring, done. Well bring done. In the shirt game. I mean, he continues yep. to do it. I, I, I'm starting to wonder. Like, okay, are these shirts that he always had, or is he now like feeling the pressure of like, well, dang, I oh, wore I, all the shirts. I talked about it. He said ones. he is. He, he is feeling the pressure. He's running out of the bank. So uh, <laughs> yeah, not, to, not to go too far behind the curtain. I know JR won't, won't fail us, but uh, we, we have discussed. But so, you know what? Yeah. Also, JR, don't feel like you need to like feed the feed the bit. Like, it's okay. You don't need to spend yeah, all you your money on new shirts. Shirt. It's okay. Yeah, you yeah. can wear regular okay. shirts. It's cool. Or, or I'll, you could start I'll at I'll the beginning. I'll put it out there, JR. Yeah. Oh yeah, just cycle cycle back cycle through. through. People like, can keep track. I, yeah. But I bet you there is a novelty T-shirt manufacturer out there making the good geek, the nerd core T-shirts oh, that we're sure. totally, totally partner with Jr. Oh we yeah, went, yeah we for sure. Deep on this, that there's Heck a whole yeah. bunch. There's a whole bunch of Android and Google themed nerd T-shirts out there. I mean, unfortunately, oh, yeah. some a lot of them on Redbubble, which isn't the 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 best, you know, the legally scrupulous. copyrighted, uh, you know, kind of one. But they, oh, those are out there for sure. Yeah. yeah. So. Maybe he needs a all about Android T-shirt, Jason. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. Are we is. sure he hasn't Should worn one merch? yet? I don't think he has. Uh, what what is it? Twit.tv. I'm trying to remember where our merch it's lives. It's in the bottom. Wait, where is it? It's, it's uh, <laughs> this is the perfect time to mention our merch, but I don't know where to send you because I can't remember. Twit.tv slash store. If you go there, you'll find a bunch of Twit stuff that you can yeah. wear. Um, we still Some have cool a vintage stuff. the tech guy shirt. Oh, hey. Yeah, that that show is not around anymore, but that's okay. You can still buy the shirt. Uh, the uh, Ask the Tech Guys is still around. We don't have that up here yet. Maybe we will. All about Android, though. It's there. I see it. You can get a sticker. You can get a shirt. You can get a sweatshirt. All sorts of things. So go there. Twit.tv slash store. Right on. That'll take you there. <laughs> um. Thanks for reading my mind, Jason. Yeah. Okay. There we go. We, yeah. We, you know, we haven't we haven't plugged the store in a while, so that was a good reminder. All <laughs> right. Coming up next, we've got some wordy emails. <laughs> and do we? We have a lot of wordy emails actually in uh, in our email block it's, this week. It's a wordy show this week, and our first yeah. email comes from Tim Benson in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Good old Tim, and he writes in. He says a request was made. In episode 631, last week's episode, for those playing at home, um, about the possible reasons for why people would be leaving Pixel behind, and I thought I would chime in. And Jason, as you mentioned, this was the prompt that we asked in the show uh, yep. uh, last week when we were talking about the brand affinity survey that went on and whether or not people would stick with the Pixel brand after having a Pixel phone. Yep. Um, and so Tim goes on to say, my wife and I have Pixel 6 Pros, and in March of 2022, yes, last year, after performing a security update, both phones lost wireless charging. Okay. Ooh. I I followed all of the troubleshoot troubleshooting requested up to and including a factory reset on both phones. Nothing ever worked, but each time they would blame it on not having a Google charging stand. Prior to the update that broke our wireless charging, it worked in two vehicles, four wireless charging stands, and on four pieces of furniture with built-in charging. That's a lot of charging capability, Tim, in your life, and I'm very impressed. Um, <laughs> yeah. Multiple calls to Google and Google Fi without any luck except buy a Google wireless charging stand. Well, we finally put together some extra cash and bought one. And guess what? Still doesn't work. So I call back, and guess what? Now they say that they cannot do anything. Why? Because of course the phones are out of warranty. Oh, Never God. once before did they ever mention warranty claims uh, when it was under warranty. We have been on been on Nexus and then on Pixel for years now and been on Google Fi for many years and we've been blown off. 
first that without warranty being an option and now that it now it isn't saying too bad your device is out of warranty so all all of so all of that to say my wife is adamant that she is getting a samsung next i really want to stay because of the pure google experience but i feel like i'm caving in and need to do my little part and send a message that send a mes message that this isn't right if they treat longtime loyal users this way how are they treating everyone else Loyal to the brand has brought me nothing. Oh my goodness. So that's Tim, no good. That's a real bummer. And that's a real great example of customer service. And honestly, as much as I as imagine you you've probably gone down this route and hate to do it, but like call them back and tell them. Just be like, listen, this is what's happened. Your response has been X. I'm now leaving your brand and see what they say. Put them to the test. You know, if yeah. they really value you, let them replace your phone. So you know, Tim, you know what I can do for you, Victor? Uh, I'm just going to say the words, email of the week. Just, I'm just going to say it. Wow. There you go. Wow. You, you, you also deserve email of the week, Tim, because, yeah, that is a total bummer. Uh, Google no, I, has I, never been really known for its support, and this is kind of an example of that. Can, can I also say that, like, like Tim, I have wireless chargers around the house. Yeah. And if you put them in the right places, if you have like a um, teenagers and kids that have like both iPhones or no matter what kind of phone they have and it does wireless charging Yeah, and they don't have the cable, if they're forced to put the phone down, it's, it's a good way to get them away from the phone sometimes. Oh, oh, put oh. it down. <laughs> no, that's yeah. a good point. To charge it. If you got a cable, you can still plug yeah. it in and like and still be lost in it. But yeah, if that's it's always been one of my cons problem. for why I don't use wireless charging is, but then I can't use my phone, and I need that to. might actually come in handy. Though I like that. That's a very <laughs> sneaky way to get yeah, the kids you, to. You can't put it on a side table yeah. next to the couch, right? Otherwise, they're they're hovering over it. Yeah, they spend yeah. their whole time looking yeah. at the phone on the on the charger like this. Maybe yeah. like on like. <laughs> Like behind one, how you have the cubby holes. And yeah. Like put it back there. They can't hover over it. There's and something that they can't. Yeah, they can't do much <laughs> when it's on the wire. That's, that's clever, though. I like that. That that's is clever. Yeah. Uh, so. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I'm and sorry, I, Tim. I hope. Yeah, I'm sorry. And thank you. And I hope that that little interlude music um, is at least makes it feel a little better. Back. It makes you feel a little better. And I just did a quick perfunctory Google search. And it looks like other people were having this issue after the update in 2022, um, the Android 13 update. So it's, there's something to your story. So I don't know. I would just call them back and just say, you're going to leave. See what they say. If it was up to me, I'd say, no, here's a, here's a pixel seven, please stay. That would, was yeah, what cause I would do. I'll say yeah. as a reviewer, I get a lot of that feedback and then I'll follow up with people and say like, but what did the manufacturer say? Yep. And if there's any conversation with them, it's very minimal. And you're like, you, you wrote your, your, I, I'm not, I'm not attacking Tim here, but it's like, you wrote your life story in a comment on a YouTube video. There's no way the manufacturer is ever right. going to get a sense of right. what this really was like without that last moment. And like what Ron's saying, that last follow up, I am leaving your brand. Yep. And and that's the, the, the critical piece of information that unfortunately I mean, it, if it's just one person calling one center, it's probably not going to contribute much. But if we really got consumers more active in that back and forth, I feel like manufacturers and developers would have a better sense of where these issues really are occurring yeah. with their products. Give, give them an opportunity to make it right. That's that's yeah. what, you know, from a customer service standpoint, as someone who, you know, like express your displeasure. And I'm sure you have. I'm not saying you haven't, Tim. It sounds like you've gone through a very frustrating kind of, kind of path, but just like say it very clearly and definitively that like, I've had, I've opened a ticket with you. I've done this sort of thing. You told me this, this is not, you know, I've been with you since Nexus. Now you've lost my business and mm -hmm. I want to give you one last chance to make it right. Oof. You know? yes. yeah. so. All right. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I have an email from Nate, by the way, triple A at TV. If you have thoughts, that's the email address that you can send your thoughts to. Nate did that and said, I've been a pixel user since switching from the one plus three to the pixel three. I've since converted five family members over to pixel phones, usually in a series. And every one of them has upgraded at least one time from pixel to pixel and continues to use pixel phones. So this is on the other side, right? In the beginning, it was camera quality that converted me and many others to pixels. Photos still look great with a pixel, but not any better or worse than photos my friends take with their later model iPhone or Galaxy devices, which speaks to just how 
how these things have really leveled out as, as far as photo quality is concerned. We're seeing a lot of high quality photos, I think, coming from a lot of devices. Nate says the superior spam call and text blocking is a game changer for me. Pair that with using the robot call screening for unknown numbers that refuse to get the hint after you ignore their first call attempt and call you back immediately. And I cannot see using a phone from any other manufacturer. Thank you, Nate. That's there the flip go. side. Um, would you agree that that these cameras are just it, like it, it's hard to? Well, you were talking earlier, actually, Juan, that that you're spending yeah. so much time on cameras right now. I'm kind of mm -hmm. like been in this position of like, yeah, well, yeah, they all do pretty good pictures. But are you seeing differently? So that's what's exciting. It, like uh, I recently just posted another photo. This was like my worst reviewed camera of 2022 was the Moto Edge Plus. And like, if you can't get a good photo out of a Moto Edge Plus, then you are really a terrible photographer. At this point, like our lowest performing cameras right. are right. are really good. Um, but for what I've been trying to do is just expand the conversation to say, like, if legitimately your experience is pull phone out of pocket, push shutter, put phone back in pocket, I still recommend Pixels at the top. Yeah, I still feel yeah. it's the most streamlined, the most accessible. You're almost the, always going to get a some of picture the, out of it. Yeah. Well, but also it's little things too, like the viewfinder is less cluttered than an iPhone. The subject tracking is amazing. Mm -hmm. Pixel subject tracking is maybe only second to a Sony. It is fantastic. And I think people don't always kind of take that ergonomics into account when they're thinking about photography. Like I get the good colors on every phone, but as soon as you start pushing some of the other limits and boundaries and settings and modes, even if it's something like pull phone out of pocket, adjust your frame, tap on your subject, look at the background, look at your exposure. That's where you really start seeing some of the evolution on these other camera sensors and these other camera apps yeah. make some really incredible images. Um, but yeah, I, I, there, there's a reason why whenever you do a blind taste test on a very simple kind of point and shooty sort of photo, Pixel A series are almost always leading that even above Pixel Pros. The Pixel A series is perfectly honed for that kind of mm -hmm. out of pocket touch shutter put back in po pocket totally. kind of interaction. Yep, totally. it, it's, it's really it's difficult to find anything that comes close. I've, it's, yeah. it's so good. I've been on the 7A uh, for the past week now. I plan on doing my review next week, but I mean, no surprise. Yeah. Like the camera experience is excellent as I expected it to be, you know, fr from exactly the perspective that you're talking about. Like it's pretty pretty simple to get a really great photo out of it if you're just pulling it out of your pocket and, and shooting a couple of times like I've, I've gotten so many great photos out of it so yeah totally agree for sure all right well that brings us to our next email of the week of the week we got two <laughs> of the week, of the week. <laughs> yes uh kevin strada writes in and says me and a childhood friend have been fans of google phones since before the nexus phones even he had a g1 on t-mobile when we were in high school and kevin you're making me feel very old um and I, i've had nexus <laughs> since the nexus 5. uh the 4 was missing lte that explains it um we've been using pixel since 2016 for the most part the only time i've switched was from the pixel 3 to the one plus 7 pro when i saw the battery from pixel 3 to 4 was smaller with more battery hogging things included I wasn't satisfied with the Pixel 3's battery. Being on Verizon and missing just physical support from Verizon, I switched back hurriedly to the Pixel 5 the next year. I almost switched to the iPhone in 2022. My Pixel 5 was showing its age, and after the dumpster fire that was the Pixel 6 series launch, I was bracing myself for the Pixel 7 series to be similarly bad. Thankful it was much better signal-wise, so my friend and I upgraded to 7 Pros. I'm the more flamboyant one, so I went hazel. I love this. <laughs> we both agree that with the Apple having adopted something very similar to call screening in the newest iOS update, if Google ever had a repeat of the 6 series disaster, we'll go to Apple. They also added camera profiles years ago that can emulate pixel photos. They've been slowly becoming more pixel-like in the last few years and vice versa. I say all this to say that we are diehard Google fans that extends far beyond phones, but Google has betrayed our trust one too many times. If we can fathom switching, so can others with similar frustrations. And I got to admit, this is the email of the week, but Kevin, you're all over the map here. You're all over the map. You're, you're, at one hand, you're saying you're a diehard Google loyalist, but 
No, I, I think you, I see what he's saying, though. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I, I think I get it because he's saying he is such a diehard Pixel fan that even he can imagine yes, right. some of Google's missteps convincing him to try another. So if someone were less of a diehard Pixel fan than he is, yep. that it would make perfect sense to him why they might want to look at that. They would off. jump. Right. But it's, you're, you're it's right. Just, his his stream of conversational consciousness it, it was, <laughs> is a little tricky to kind of untangle the thread of yeah. what he's trying to say. But and, and, it, and it just goes to show that it just takes one thing that you rely on or the, you, whether it's battery life or whatever it yeah. might be to, to have you look, you know, I might look next door at the OnePlus or might look next door at the Samsung or let me go across the street to Apple and see what they've got. And especially with Apple, you know, basically playing feature catch up to Android after, you know, year after year, like, oh, there's another thing. There's another thing. You know? And then introducing their own, you know, you know, kind of, you know, unique things here and there. Um, it's fathom, it's fathomable, um, for someone. And sometimes <laughs> you just want change, right? You just want to mix it up, right? Like one of the reasons why I like my, um, the pixel seven so much is because it mixes it up. It looks different than other phones I've had. And that yep. scratches that itch for me. So it's, it, mm -hmm. everybody is fickle when it comes to these things though. So, well, and I think they should be, and, and yeah. I would like to see a little bit more while we still have some good competition out there. Yeah. Cause that's always one of the drum beats on my channel is to say like, if you're looking at these kinds of features and you say they really care to you, that you really care about them, you know, there's a phone that does that. And it's like specifically built around that. And you can get the perfect fit for your needs as opposed to, well, but I've always bought this brand. And we want to be careful because we like familiarity, but we don't want to get so entrenched or so locked in that then, you know, we're stuck and that we right. can't ever can't possibly do anything it. else. Mm -hmm. Or that all manufacturers just start kind of copying the same choices. Like, I really don't like how how many Chinese phones are copying Apple's split notification shade. Mm -hmm. I think that's a bad thing to copy. I think it's bad software design, but they're looking at what's really successful and what works for iOS fans, and they're trying to emulate what I think is a, is a bad piece of software. So right. as, as long as we can kind of keep moving around and we can kind of say, hey, I really want a phone that can do this, there's a phone that can really achieve that, then we end up with the best sort of uh, vibrant landscape of competition and options for people to uh, to get what they need. Yep. So it's interesting. So Jason, we we put the call out. We yeah. got several responses here. Do you, do you feel satisfied in your question? Is the understanding <laughs> whether people, you know. Well, I mean, there were even other emails that didn't make it in. We got a bunch of other emails yeah. that were uh, you know that were talking about this. And I'm kind of looking through to see, but I guess here. I guess as a sample, as a sample size, you pick three. Yeah. You pick you pick these emails that that kind of give a good array of response. Sure. W did did any one dominate the other ones that we got? Was it just like overwhelming with people who would who would like, yeah, I'll jump in a second, or people saying that I'm more? It was loyal, pretty even, you know. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was pretty. That's yeah. what I think. Yeah. yeah. I um, see that. I don't know. I don't know if the report, you know, the 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 how the report collected its information, you know, whether it was truly representative. I do think that there is an undercurrent and actually the the last email kind of, you know, spells this out in the end um, about being betraying their trust one too many times. And I think as a from a brand perspective, Google has done that not just with its phones, but in a number of different ways. And even yeah. people who are you know, brand loyalists, whatever that means, are starting to kind of hit that point. And I think that's right. that's bad news for for a brand. And uh, I, Google is not immune to the um, to to what happens, you know, in light of that. So I think I think that the responses that we got from people in regards to that report um, seemed to kind of spell that out, you know, you I, I love Pixel, but this happened. And I got to yep. say at this point, like, yeah, I would consider it because that happened. I think that's pretty representative. And I, that yep. appears to be what the report was saying. So, yep. yeah, I think I'm satisfied with that. Although we'll probably hear All from right. more people. And it's okay. If you still have opinions on this, <laughs> let us know. AAA at twit.tv. And thank you, Kevin, for being the email of the week. Kevin and Tim. Sorry, Nate. Yours was really great, too. 
There you go. That one's for you, Nate. Okay. <laughs> We've reached the end of All About Android. It's been a lot of fun. And Juan, it's been a great time hanging out with you yeah. uh, for a change, not, you know, swapping us out for each other. But uh, somegadgetguide.com, where, what do you want to leave people with? What do you want people to know? I, I mean, the, we've got a lot of fun stuff coming up. I've been all over the place with phones and tablets and computers and batteries and outdoor tech and e-bikes. And, and it really is, for, for all of the headlines that have been coming out about like, oh, this downturn in phone sales, um, this is a really good time to kind of reinvest in the kit that you already own. And so those are a lot of the conversations I'm going to be trying to have over the summer where You've probably got a, a computer in your pocket that is more than capable, and maybe there are just some fun things to explore you hadn't thought of doing with it before. And and I think you know anything we can do to kind of keep tech out of landfills, these are the kinds of conversations I'm really going to be f uh, focused on and and sort of fixating on. I'm hoping I was hoping to be able to make an announcement on your podcast, but unfortunately I can't. Oh. But I am working and I'm talking to another outlet about maybe joining their team and doing a little expanded coverage cool. for, for like buyer's guides and, uh, and, and like fun tech. And again, this sort of outdoor and accessory conversation, but I can't say anything just yet. So stay tuned. Hopefully I can say something soon about a future collaboration that I think will be a lot of fun. Right on. Well, thank you. Definitely everyone stay tuned to Juan for that. And uh, yeah, let's do this again sometime, Juan. This is Hell yeah, yeah. definitely. Heck yeah. What about you, Ron? What do you all want to leave people with? Uh, yeah, just follow me over on Twitter and Instagram at RonXO, uh, where I post occasionally. Um, and go check out Scorbit if you're into pinball. Uh, it's in the Google Play Store. Uh, we just released an app update, uh, fixed a couple of bugs over the weekend. Uh, so plug in along, keep track of your pinball scores with Scorbit. So. Right on. Excellent. Scorbit.io. Uh, yep. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, JR. Android Intelligence uh, can be found at androidintel.net slash twit. So go there. You can subscribe to the newsletter. Thank you, Victor, uh, for doing all that you do. Thank you, Burke, who's in the other room uh, participating in our Slack as he watches. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and everybody else who helped us do this show here at the studio each and every week. We couldn't do it without you. Uh, you can find me just uh, uh, Tech News Weekly, twit.tv slash TNW every Thursday. And uh, I join uh, Micah Sargent, co-host on that show. So we're going to be doing a show here in a couple of days, interviewing some people and talking to each other with our own stories of the week. We have a lot of fun with that show. So twit.tv slash TNW. Don't forget Club Twit, twit.tv slash Club Twit is our uh, our own way for you to contribute directly to what we do. If you pay $7 per month, you get all of our shows with no ads. You get exclusive uh, podcast content. It's a Twit Plus podcast feed that has all sorts of pre and post show discussions, has uh, shows that you can't find outside of the club, hands on Windows, hands on Mac, uh, Home Theater Geeks, the Untitled Linux Show, Stacy's Book Club, lots of uh, kind of off the cuff interviews. Sometimes Aunt Pruitt, who manages the club, will sit down with different people, Victor very recently, um, and talk to them just about them, the people behind Twit and, and you know, who do uh, everything here to get you the shows that we do so you get that uh that feed content you get a members only discord which is a ton of fun all for seven dollars a month so twit.tv slash club twit and you can join not only that you support us directly when you do that and i can't tell you how much we appreciate that especially right now things are a little bit challenging so Thank you. Twit.tv slash club twit. Um, as for this show, just go to twit.tv slash AAA. We have a new, oh, I didn't know they've updated the header art. That's awesome. We have new. Look at those smiling faces. That's, I love that's it. rad. We're yeah. all in the in the studio. Yeah. That's so cool. That's cool. Uh, so go to twit.tv slash AAA and check out the new photo that is just really awesome. And also subscribe. If you have not subscribed, that is the most important thing I think you can do. So if you just kind of go here and there and watch at random, you do us a huge solid as a podcast business by subscribing to our feeds so you get them automatically. We just appreciate that and it really helps us out. Twit.tv slash AAA. That is it for this week's episode of All About Android. Next week, I'm going to review this, the Pixel 7a on the show. And I'm sure we're going to have a lot more in store for you then. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you next time on All About Android. Bye, everybody. Ha <laughs> ha.
YouTube face. <laughs> hey there, Scott Wilkinson here. In case you hadn't heard, Home Theater Geeks is back. Each week, I bring you the latest audio video news, tips and tricks to get the most out of your AV system, product reviews, and more. You can enjoy Home Theater Geeks only if you're a member of Club Twip, which costs seven bucks a month. Or you can subscribe to Home Theater Geeks by itself for only $2.99 a month. I hope you'll join me for a weekly dose of Home Theater Geekitude.